2015, I was in uh, the Hatchby Shoe, and uh, I just I was finishing up doing a shoe term for uh, for possession of a weapon. Uh, I normally walk around with a knife in prison, <laughs> so I'm doing a 14 month shoe term. I'm doing a 14 month shoe term, and uh, my merch comes up. So at the time, um, this is when all the big homies were coming out of Pelican Bay, and uh, I got word of mouth that Chavo from Bakersfield did New Folsom. So he was like, hey, anybody from Bakersfield getting out the shoes, come up to New Folsom and report. So me, being a super Sudanio and down for the cause and, and down for the gang and down for my neighborhood, um, I, I was like, all right, cool. So when I went to, when I, my Mert was up, I asked for New Folsom. Uh, I could have went anywhere else. I could have went back to Kern Valley, been close to home and visited my family and my kids. But me being trying to be me, I went to New Folsom. So I show up to New Folsom on the bus ride, and uh, it was me and a few few bunch of my homies that uh, that I've done time with. Uh, my celly ended up being wacky from F Troop, which I know him. I got me and him. We've done time together. We've done shoot time together. And we've done uh, 180 time together, level four 180. So when we hit the yard, uh, Boggle from Mike Fence was there also. He was on the bus with us, and uh, we trip out because as soon as we hit the yard, you had Alfie from Little Valley. Uh, no, Happy Valley, Happy Valley. Alfie from Happy Valley, and uh, you had Chavo, of course, Chavo from Bakers. I was more excited for Chavo because he was from Bakersfield. He's the only, only uh, big homie from Bakersfield. So I'm, I'm anxious to see what's going on and basically see what he wanted. <laughs> well, as soon as we get there, we check out the yard. There's Nathaniel's on the yard. There's a couple of NS on the yard. We got the blacks. They got their area. We're, we're taking our tour of the yard, and uh, and uh, we, we off to the side, we see a group of homies out by the bleachers, out by the by the track. And I remember when This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. When we were getting our little tour of the of the yard, we hit up the homies. Um we said, Hey, who's that group right there? You know, were they, were they bulldogs or who are they? He said, Oh, those are coming out right there. Those are homies. They go, But they're on level. And we go, What? And like the homie that's giving us the tour is like, Oh, but they're on they're on disregard. We're like, Disregard? Think, yeah, but it's more like level. Those are the dudes that couldn't pay their bills, and they're on level. They're not allowed to come in our area. They're not allowed this. Not, they're not allowed that. And and that should have been the first sign that me and and the few homies that got there, we were like, well, wait a minute, that's not that's kind of not right, you know. Uh, me personally, you're not gonna call me level. I mean, I'm not gonna. This isn't YA. This isn't juvenile hall. You're not gonna play these little YA games with me. I'm either part or I'm not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So there was a good issue about it. about 10, 10, about 10 to 15, and these are dudes that couldn't pay their bills or anything. So eventually, I ended up talking to to Chavo, and I, one of his little representatives was was a dude from Oki Bakers. And he was a youngster, just a youngster. He never been nowhere. He never put in a work, but he had money, and and that's the way it kind of is nowadays. If you got money, you have the big homies ears, and you have their you have their attention because you can provide money for them, you know? So even though me, I have LWAP, I have Life Without, plus a 25 to Life on top of that, you know, I'm willing to go, you know, <laughs> run up on anybody and anything and lay down anybody and anything for the cause. I still don't mean as much to him, the big homie, as compared to these other dudes with money. So long story short, him and uh, his secretary come and talk to me. This is Chavo, Chavo's secretary come and talk to me. They're like, hey, you know, your neighborhood owes money. And I'm like, what? <laughs> They're like, yeah, your neighborhood owes taxes. You guys you guys owe money. You guys owe a couple thousand bucks. Uh, go ahead and uh, call your neighborhood, you know, and handle that. Get us our money. And I, I kind of felt, I was like, well, wait a minute, hold on. This is what you called me for. You know, you called me up here. I came halfway up the state <laughs> to come and, and just listen to this. And I was like, okay, well, look, you know, I don't mind trying to do what I can do, but I, I mean, I can't promise you nothing. I'm not on the streets, and I haven't been on the streets for quite a while. So uh, I can try my best to get you what you have coming or what you feel you have coming from those guys out there on the streets. So I try to call and, and call my neighborhood and see what's going on. And, and during this time, during my neighborhood, there's this, this turmoil. My whole neighborhood was just at war with each other. I mean, dudes just shooting each other, beating each other up, fighting each other. It was, it was a power struggle out there on the streets. Um, some people thought they weren't getting the respect they deserved. 
some people who didn't have no respect thought they deserved more respect. <laughs> so it was just a big old, big old, uh, you know, disaster. And uh, long story short, they told me, he was like, look, you only have a couple of days before your neighbor is green lighted. So I'm sitting there like, well, look, you know, I went and told, I told Chavo myself, like, look, you know, I don't have money like that to give you. And, I, you know, in my head, I'm like, I'm damn sure not going to give you my mom and dad's hard-earned money. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I'm not going to ask my kids and their mom for money, you know. Basically, I, I, it's, I, I don't have no money, and I'm not going to give you, you know, my family's money. So I let them know, like, hey, look, you know, if there's any other way that I can help out, I will help out. I'm right here, please, you know, let me know. You know, you're talking to a guy who has a, a, a thousand years to do, so there's, there's got to be something else I can pay <laughs> or, you know, compensate some, some, some other way. So the day came and went. They gave me a certain date that they said my neighborhood was going to get green lighted. And all my buddies, like, you know, all my buddies on the yard, they've told me, like, hey, we heard your neighbor's going to get green lighted pretty soon. Don't trip. You know, you're in prison. You've been down a good five, six years. It shouldn't affect you. You know, it should only affect these dudes on the streets, you know. And I'm like, I, I, in the back of your mind, you want that reassurance, but then again, you never really know. Because when it comes to their homies, of course, they can do whatever they want. At, at the time, uh, the day finally came when, when my neighbor was supposed to be green lighted. So I was on my toes. I'm on, I'm walking the yard. And, and remember, like, we have mandatory yards, so we have to come out to the yard. You know, we have to go here and we have to go there. Um, you have to have a good reason to stay inside your cell. Oh, I don't feel like coming out today. Yeah, you need a good reason to stay in, you know, when, when you're an active South Side or a Sureno, Southern Hispanic. You know, you need a really good reason why you're not coming out the cell. You know, and, and it, I, I see why they do that. They do that because, hey, if you need to get disciplined or you need to get hit or you need to get yelled at, they need they need a, they need you out there to touch you, you know, and I understand that. Also, it's also for other races, you know, just in case we jump with the blacks or we jump with the whites, we jump with the northern Mexicans, the northern Hispanics, you know. At least we're all there. We were all there, you know, and we gave it our all. So... Um, the day that, uh, it was four days after my neighbor got green lighted, I was on the yard and I was playing handball. And, uh, it was, it was, it's, uh, I remember because I was, uh, I finished playing handball and I was leaning up against the handball wall taking a break. And I know they waited for me to, to, to play all those games of handball before they did it. But, and, and it was funny because prior to the handball games, I seen the homeboy over by the benches digging up in the dirt with his foot, with his boot. And I, and me, being me, I've always been the guy to volunteer. I always raise my hand to go on missions. Yeah, I'll hit that dude. Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll stab that dude. Because I have priors. I've done it before. Um, I stabbed a dude in my first term, my first prison term back in 2002. I also stabbed a guy in 2005 on Wasco reception year. Um, and also when I picked up this LWAP, I stabbed a guy in Wasco reception D yard. And, uh, so I have priors. I know how to do it, and I'm not going to shake or buckle like some of these guys will, uh, especially some of these youngsters that, that have never stabbed anybody. So I was in there, and I seen homeboy digging up the digging up the knife, and I walked up to him, and I tried to block for him, make sure when no cop looking that the gun tower wasn't looking or nothing. And I asked him, like, hey, is everything cool? He was like, yeah, yeah, everything's cool. And I think... Now that I think back, he was taking a breath that I came up to him, and I was like, hey, if, there's any, if you need any help, let me know. I'm always right here. Because that's the way I've always been. I've always been one to volunteer me, especially, you know, with all the time that I have. Uh, homeboy's like, no, it's cool. We got it. So I walk away, take, take a couple laps, start playing handball. Well, after the handball, I'm sitting there sweaty. I'm tired. And uh, homeboy calls me up. Um uh, he calls me over. To, he calls me over. Hey, Master, come here. Let me talk to you. You have 60 seconds remaining. Uh, two days prior to that, one of the yard crew workers rolled it up. So he calls me over. He's like, "Hey, hey, uh, Monster, come over here." So I get up and I walk over. Anybody calls you over, you know, you you, you walk up to him. You know, yeah, what's up? You know, what's going on? You're in question. And uh, as soon as I did that, I didn't know, but later I found out. Uh, two guys came up started walking behind me. They were pretty far away. They were far enough away to where I was comfortable, you know, say about 10 to 15 feet away from me. 
so when I walk up to Omar and I'm like, yeah, what's up? He mentions it to me. Hey, there's a job opening on the yard food. Do you want it? And I'm like, uh, yeah. And he's like, okay, and he walks away. <laughs> as soon as he t- turns around and walks away, that's when, uh, that's when uh, also from uh, Redugal and, uh, and Gato from uh, Escondido got on me. They came up behind me. Two, uh, one had a, a flat blade knife and the other one had a uh, ice pick. And they started stabbing, stabbing me all in my back. Boom, boom, boom. And immediately, you don't feel it because the adrenaline is just, you know, it's rushing. All you think is you're just getting rushed. I didn't know they had knives. So I, and these are big dudes. Uh, also, and and Cat, they're both about six feet each. They're pretty big, big size, healthy Mexicans. Uh, I turn around, and I'm 5'11". I'm about 180, 180 pounds, so I turn around, and I'm pretty healthy. I turn around, and I start slanging them. I'm fighting them with both of them. And uh, I was... I was lucky because they were both on disregard. They're both on level. They both owed drug money. So they had to stab me in order to clear up their debt and clear up their name. So one of them, that was also from Redugal, his heart really wasn't in it. He was just trying to, you know, do what he had to do, make it look good so he can get off disregard. I can go to the hole or I can, you know, you know whatever. I can just get off the yard. He was just trying to make a commotion. Um, Cat from Escondido, uh, he was on me. He was trying to <laughs> make a name for himself. He was trying to really kill me. <laughs> he was he was trying to puncture me. He was trying to. Uh, a couple of times I, I had to was bobbing and weaving. Uh, I got hit in the cheek, in the chin, um, the back of my head, the back of my neck. Um, I one of them punctured my lung. Um, the flat blade, which I believe was was cat, uh, got me down low in my lower back, and I, I think you're around your kidneys. I'm not too sure, but that one hurt the most, and I felt that one. Besides the besides the punctured lungs, I felt that one down there by by the lower back, by the pelvis. I felt that one. I was like, wow. But uh, I kept fighting. I kept you know kept trying to sling them. I was backing them up a little bit. Um, they're pretty big guys. Like I said, they were six foot something, close to 200 pounds. So I was fighting for my life, which I, that's what I thought it was. You know, when you're fighting for your life, no matter who it is, they're going to fight, and you're going to fight. You're going to give it your all, and you're going to give it your best. Besides the adrenaline rushing, uh, it's just such a rush that you, you know, you're in it to win it. You're going to win or, or, or nothing. Um, eventually, I heard the CEOs come running up. You know, they're, they're telling us to get down. They're, they're, they're spraying. Well, I'm not going to get down. It's a two-on-one. It's two guys against me, and they got knives. So I'm not going to get down until these guys are down. Um, we get bombs thrown at us. We get pepper sprayed. Um, it was funny because when I was standing there, I backed up a little bit. One of the CEOs threw a, a handheld bomb, and it landed right between my legs. And I'm wearing basketball shorts. That's what I wear to the yard, to work out and such. And it blew up. And when it blew up, the pepper spray, the powder, went straight up my shorts into my boxers. <laughs> so so now my crotch is burning. <laughs> my legs are burning. I'm just burning. I'm hurting. I'm bleeding. Um, I'm, I'm getting, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to feel the, 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 the wounds and the, uh, the punches. So they get down eventually. Seals come over, handcuff me, and... Uh, try to get me to get on a stretcher. They bring a stretcher up, try to get me to get on, and me, my adrenaline is still pumping. I, I don't want to let my guard down, so I don't want to get on the stretcher. Because I'm thinking, if I get on the stretcher, these dudes, or lay down, you know, they're, one, they're going to rush and, and jump on me again. Second, you just don't want to get carried off a prison yard like that. You're not going to carry me. It was a pride thing, and you're not going to take me off the yard like that. You know, it wasn't that. I'm still up. I'm still breathing. It's hard for me to breathe because I got the punctured lung. But you're not going to take me out like that. You know, I got pride. You know, I thought I did. <laughs> so it took me a while to finally get on the stretcher. And finally they take me down to medical. And uh, I'm handcuffed to the to the gurney. And uh, this is New Folsom. This is uh, this is Repressa, California, which is by Folsom. Also known as Folsom, New Folsom. So I go to the hospital. They take me to the hospital because I have a punctured lung. They take me to UC Davis. Very nice, very nice hospital. Very nice I mean, facility. Um, I had so many tests ran on me. I did have a puncture done. They repaired it. Um, 
I uh, was given so many tests. But I, was, I only stayed there three days. I was there three days. And after the third day, I came back to the prison and immediately thrown in ad seg. And um, in ad seg, of course, there were I was, I was still running active. I, I didn't I didn't ask for protective custody. Um, I was still an active you know gang member, and I wanted to know what was up because what I was was kept telling was that hey, just because your neighborhood's not green lighted, you won't be stabbed, you won't be hit, you won't be disciplined. You know, it's more of a street thing because that's where all the money's at is on the streets. You know, so. I immediately knew. I'm like, okay, my neighborhood's green lighted. From here on out, the people that are on the streets are going to catch the blues on the streets from other gangs. My the, the people from my homeboys from my gang, when they come inside the county jail, they're going to get blasted. They're going to get stabbed. You know, they're going to get assaulted. You know, because that's what happens when your neighborhood gets green lighted. Whether it's for taxes, whether it's for any kind of gang infraction that you do, that's what happens. You know, and um. So I'm in that sig, and everybody, everybody tell me, and, and guess who I see? I see also from <laughs> Um He sees me. He's like, "Hey, what's up?" And I'm like, "What's up?" You know? He's like, "You're still active. I'm still active. I'm, I'm, I didn't go. I, I'm not protective custody. Didn't TC up. I'm still right here. I'm always gonna fight for mine." He's like, "Okay." He kind of at first didn't want to talk to me, and then I found out later from some of the other guys there. He was saying that because I was gone for three days in the hospital. He was telling everybody that he killed me. Oh, yeah, we killed that dude. He's dead. <laughs> so I know I kind of bursted his bubble when I showed up in the, in the hole and in the ad egg <laughs> alive, you know. And when I told everyone my name and, you know. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. They were surprised to see a walking ghost just pop in, you know. Um, so, uh, so I'm there in the ad egg, and uh, that's right around the time when uh, – when the, when the ABs on uh, B Yard killed Yogi Pineda, the, the BGF, this is 2015, uh, when Yogi Pinella died, when they, when they killed him. So all in that sake, you have a bunch of white Mexicans and blacks just filling it up, just filling it up. They had to, they, There were so many people in there that they took a lot of people to Old Folsom, which is the old castle prison just down the street. And they put them inside the hole there. There was just so many of us because it was a big, you know, big riot, you know, and just people always getting hit. Um, from there, I stayed I stayed in the ad sec for about six, seven months. Uh, I went to committee, and uh, they had I, I, IGI, uh, which is the, uh, the uh, gang investigators, prison gang investigators came, and they're like, hey, man, you know, look, you got stabbed from this guy. You know, you got stabbed from, from travel from bankers. You know, we know this. We know this because there's people that are piecing up you on, on a daily basis, and they're telling us that your name is on the list, your name is in the hat, you know, you're wanted by travel from bankers. You know, um, he wants you dead. He wants you hit. He wants you dead. Um, me, I was not. In, in my eyes and in my book, I'm like, look, you know, I did nothing wrong. I didn't snitch on anybody. I didn't rat on anybody. I'm not a. I didn't rat anybody. I didn't, I'm not a child. Mom. I'm not the usual guy that gets targeted for stabbings and stickings in prison. You know, I'm still trying to hold my composure and hold my respect. And this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. I kind of feel kind of wrong because I'm sitting there like, well, you know, because of my homeboys on the streets. I'm getting hit inside prison, you know, because because of what's going on, you know, because of the lack of money, you know, that's not going to where it's supposed to go. I'm getting assaulted. I'm getting stabbed. I'm getting hit, even though it has really nothing to do with me. Um, and it was funny because even though I was a victim in the ad sake, I was still the guy that everyone came like, Monster, are you okay? Because they knew my situation. They knew that I was kind of wrongly hit. It wasn't wrongly hit, but it was, no one would openly say that, but they knew my situation. They knew that I wasn't back there for drugs, getting into a drug den, for snitching or for ratting or because I had funny paperwork, you know. I was back there because, hey, my neighborhood caught a green light and I just happened to be from that neighborhood, you know. Um, I eventually went to Calipat. I was supposed to go to Kern Valley, level 4, 180, 
but at committee, I was told that I was going to a 270, and I didn't even know where Calipat was. It, Calipat was a 270 down south, um, and uh, I was told I was going there. So I let everyone know. I, let, I sent word to Chavo, hey, this is where I'm going. When I get there, I'll try and contact you, and maybe we can try to work something out. We can talk this through. You know, I'm trying to get back in good graces. You know, I want to just do my time, you know, healthily and, you know, normally, <laughs> you know. So uh, after seven months and a half sick, I go down to Calipat. And as soon as I get to Calipat, I see I see in every building they have a, a metal detector, a walk-through metal detector. Uh, this is a, this is B Yard. This is Calipat B Yard. It's still active. As soon as I get there, I, 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 I bust out my paperwork. I let everyone know, hey, look, I just finished getting hit in New Folsom. And, and things like that raise a flag. They raise flags. You know, okay, well, look, why did you get hit? For what reason? You know. So I had to explain myself quite a few times, so quite a few times, and let them know, hey, look, this is why I got hit. You know, go ahead and contact this person. Um, when I got there, uh, Richie from San Diego was the only big homie that was there. And uh, so it took a little while for me to get an audience with him and talk with him and get my get my situation explained to him. Well, during that whole time, um, Chavo from uh, Baker's is calling down there because he has a he has a, a nephew. Uh, he was calling himself his nephew. He was also calling himself his son. It's basically Chavo, Chavo's girlfriend. That was Chavo's girlfriend's son. So it's kind of a one of those complicated relationships. Well, he was in contact with him all the time. And as soon as he found out that I was there, he called. He contacted Chavo. He was like, hey, Monster from Bakersfield is here. He's here. He's here on the yard. So right away, Chavo was like, well, look, he's there. I want him hit again. Keep hitting him. I want him hit. His name's on the list. Well, when Richie heard my situation, heard my uh, heard my situation, heard my my uh, my situation, he told Chavo no. He told him, hey, you know, I, I got other things to deal with right now, because at at that time, that's when Donito was on C yard. Donito was another uh, uh, MM member who eventually, uh, a couple weeks later, got killed on the yard. So. That whole time, Chavo kept being told no, and I stayed. I stayed on Calipat B Yard for about three months. But those three months, they were kind of rough because as soon as I would come out, as soon as I hit the yard for yard time, you have 60 seconds remaining. Nobody really wanted to kick with me. And if you ever walk out on the yard and you're walking by yourself the whole two, three hours, you realize how lonely you are. <laughs> 